All right, hello there, everyone. Thanks for coming today to, for Kristen Sachs' thesis defense. I'm very excited for this day. Uh, before I do a short introduction, I just wanted to go over the Zoom etiquette for the thesis defense today. So uh, please keep yourself muted uh, during the defense and please uh, don't try to share your screen and you can keep your video off if you would like. Then at the end of the thesis defense, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions live to Kristen. And so if you'd like to ask her a question, you can use the raise your hand feature, which is under the reactions tab, which is down at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So just click on the raise hand and then that will allow me to call on you. And when I call on you, we'll ask you to unmute yourself. And at that point, please turn on your video so that Kristen can see you and you can ask her a question and, and have a little conversation. Afterwards, after we're done with questions, we'll ask everybody then who's still there to please turn on your video and give Kristen a big congratulations. Uh, and then at that point, we'll ask everyone to leave except for Kristen's thesis committee as we'll meet with her and have a short committee meeting uh, at the very end. All right, so a little bit about Kristen and her background, as you see here, for her thesis, she did research looking at the effects of ocean acidification and hypoxia on reproduction in rockfish. So she really was the mother to rockfish and spent a lot of time rearing and caring for them and their babies uh, in the lab. Right, she's, she was pretty much born to be a marine biologist. She was growing up near the ocean, spent a lot of time at the beaches, always getting wet. Uh, you know, this, this is definitely the career for her. Right. She also, as you can see, she was pretty meticulous at note taking, even from an early age and recording data. So all good signs, right, that she chose the right career path. And for her research, as you'll see, I mean, she had to be very organized, very focused and very meticulous in everything that she did uh, to get the type of data that, that she was able to collect. All right. She's also always up for adventure, you know, whether that's bossing around her brothers, traveling around through furry friends or as you can see in the upper left there, you know, quite a fashionista uh, when she was out hiking. I mean, I think you should still rock those, that, that look, Kristen. Quite the combo. <laughs> yeah, beautiful color combination there. All right, a little bit about her academic background. So Kristen got her bachelor's degree in environmental studies from Santa Clara University. And then when she finished, uh, she worked um, doing some research in aquaculture uh, for a number of years before coming here to Moss Landing for graduate school. As you can see there, right, she really started her career playing out, you know, playing with shellfish, you know, there in the inner title. But then when she finished uh, college, she was an aquaculture technician with Taylor's Shellfish Farm. She was working on oyster reproduction. You know, she, she was kind of curious, you know, why are these guys growing up their Pacific oysters in Hawaii as opposed to growing them, you know, in the Puget Sound in Washington? And that was because, you know, acidic waters were becoming a problem. She then became a biological technician at the University of Washington, doing some research on culturing rock scallops, as well as research studying ocean acidification effects in oysters. And so she had a lot of great experience studying ocean acidification, and she applied to work with me and Cheryl Logan at CSUMB. Um, you know, we were like, well, we don't, we're not really working with shellfish in this issue, but we are working with rockfish. And so we con convinced her to come on board and start working with fishes, and she's never looked back. So now she's dancing with the fishes, and she's out there, she did her thesis work, as she'll tell you about studying ocean acidification and hypoxia effects in rockfish and how it affects reproduction. She also, while she was here at Moss Landing, was a field technician for the Marine Pollution Studies Lab at Moss Landing, where she did a lot of fish collections and dissections. She also served as a research technician for the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center, basically doing you know, some similar things to what she did with rockfish, but now studying climate change effects on salmon egg development. So as she'll tell you for her thesis, Again, as you'll see, she was a loving and caring mama of all these baby rockfish, right? She worked on a whole bunch of projects in Moss Landing. So she started working with us even before she started graduate school on our NSF project, looking at ocean acidification and hypoxia effects in juvenile rockfish. And then she proceeded to work as well on our California Sea Grant and then a NOAA Salt and Stall Kennedy project where, which she did for her thesis, which was this work looking at ocean acidification and hypoxia on reproduction in rockfish. She was a California Sea Grant research trainee and she just spent so much time uh, doing this work. Most of it was done at the NOAA lab up in Santa Cruz. So she was splitting time between Moss Landing and the NOAA lab. She was out there fishing, catching fish and bringing them back to the lab, rearing pregnant females, having them spawn, taking care of their babies. You know, and, and she did this work with an army of, of other people. It's just 
uh, each data point you'll see in your thesis took a tremendous amount of work uh, to be able to collect. She also likes to present her research and she did that a number of times. Here's an example where she was presenting her work in the Western Society of Naturalists meeting. And of course, after she gave her talk, you'll see she's, she delivers a very nice seminar, but then you know she got involved with some of the team building and some of the other extracurricular activities. I just can't believe how low you can limbo. I would fall over in a heartbeat. <laughs> Right, Kristen also serves as a teaching assistant for our subtitle ecology class, our Kelp Force ecology class in 2020. This was the COVID year, so we started out the year and Kristen was helping with all the diving logistics for the students in the class, helping them with their independent research projects, and then had to work with us as we transitioned halfway through the year to making a field class into a virtual online class, uh, which was quite a challenge, but Kristen was an amazing help uh, uh, for this class. Right. She's also an accomplished mentor and teacher. So for all those projects that she worked on with us in the NOAA lab, she helped us supervise just dozens and dozens of undergraduates from San Jose State, UC Santa Cruz, and CSU Monterey Bay. She served as the lead mentor for a number of students through the Coast um, Mentoring Program and then the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Center Program at CSU Monterey Bay. So helping some students with independent research projects that were related to the work that she was doing. She also served as a marine science naturalist at Camp Sea Lab for one summer where she was teaching middle school students about marine ecosystems on this California coast, as well as served as the science instructor on their liveaboard boat for that summer. So yeah, she's really great, you know, working with students and teaching as well. And so with that, you know, Kristen's gonna spend a little time here um, telling you what she did for her thesis. And then at the end, hopefully we can celebrate with her and all her accomplishments. And <laughs> as you can tell, she knows how to party. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so Kristen, oh, God. Okay, and uh, we'll celebrate soon. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Scott. Um, that was a really fun little trip down memory lane. Um, thank you, Mom, for providing those pictures. I kind of thought the one with me with frosting dripping down my face might appear. <laughs> that was the best. It was. A, it's a pretty good one. <laughs> okay, well, I will go ahead and stop um, sharing my video and move on to my presentation. All right, so thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to learn a little bit about my research. My research is on the effects of climate change induced ocean acidification and hypoxia on gopher rockfish larvae. And we conducted this research because rockfish reproductive success may be negatively affected by the multiple stressors associated with climate change. And so we conducted physiological and morphometric trials on rockfish larvae so that we could understand both the sensitivities and tolerances to the changing ocean chemistry. I'll start by orienting you to the format of my presentation with a brief outline. There will be a blue rectangle at the top left corner that will let you know what part of the presentation we're on. I'll begin with background, then move on to research questions and hypotheses. I'll explain some of the more broad methods of the entire experiment before breaking things down section by section. My first section is deformity, fecundity, and morphology, where I'll present on the methods, results, and conclusions. My next section is survival. Um, and again, I'll present on methods, results, and conclusions. Um, and then my last section is respirometry. And again, I'll present on my methods, results, and conclusion uh, for, the, for that individual section. And I'll finish up my presentation with my discussion and acknowledgements. All right, so let's begin with some background info. I'll start by explaining how the water chemistry of our oceans is changing due to climate change. Our oceans are experiencing deoxygenation that is caused by warmer atmospheric temperatures that heat surface waters, leading to stratification. Um, and that prevents the mixing of oxygenated surface waters with deeper oxygen poor water. And the oxygen minimum zone is actually a natural feature of the ocean, but recent studies indicate that the oxygen minimum zone or OMZ is expanding towards the surface in response to climate change. And that depletes oxygen from the coastal shelf habitat. Our ocean ecosystems are not only dealing with deoxygenation, but also ocean acidification. 
As I think we all know by now, burning fossil fuels releases CO2 into the atmosphere and CO2 concentrations are currently the highest they've been for the last 3 million years. And for anybody that saw the most recent IPCC report, um, things are not looking great. So as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, it increases in the ocean, which ultimately leads to a reduced pH and um, ultimately, ultimately a more acidic ocean. So the surface water pH of our oceans has decreased by 0.1 units since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and as the pH scale is logarithmic, this translates to a 30% increase in acidity. And furthermore, it's actually predicted to decrease by 0.4 units by 2100, which means a 150% increase in acidity. And um, this IPCC figure, that's the International Panel of Climate Change, um, shows pH changes more locally in the California current. Panel A shows the year 1750, panel B shows 2005, and panel C shows in the future to year uh, 2050, and that's a projection. And in the figure, blues correspond to higher pH and reds and yellows correspond to a lower pH. And so as you can see, um, the California current is becoming more acidic and the pH is projected to decrease by 0.2 to 0.3 um, by the year 2050. So now I'd like to elaborate a little bit more on my study system, the California current, um, and talk to you kind of about how it's being impacted by climate change. The California current is cool water that flows southward along the North American West Coast. And it is one of the most biologically productive systems in the world, largely due to upwelling. And upwelling is a natural feature of the California current. Um, we have northerly winds that drive the ekman transport of surface waters offshore due to the Coriolis effect. And this causes deep, cold, low pH, low dissolved oxygen, and high nutrient water to be drawn up to the surface. And this process stimulates phytoplankton blooms, which nourish healthy zooplankton, fish, marine mammal, and bird populations, as well as healthy fisheries. However, climate change is altering the timing and the intensity of coastal up upwelling. And scientists are concerned about how this will impact the California current ecosystem. Higher CO2 concentrations create warmer temperatures on land due to the greenhouse effect. And this increases the land sea thermal gradient um, and that actually produces more frequent and stronger northerly winds, which makes upwelling events more severe. And additionally, the source waters have become more acidic due to ocean acidification and also lower in oxygen content, um, which leads to more acidic and lower oxygen waters intruding onto the coastal shelf. And we want to know how this will impact the local ecosystem. And during these upwelling events, um, the stressors are not isolated, but rather occur simultaneously. So this figure shows water sampled from the Monterey Bay Aquarium intake pipes at 17 meters depth. Um, and they did this sampling in April of 2010, so in the springtime. And springtime is the strongest upwelling season in Monterey Bay. And this, uh, this figure shows what a extreme upwelling event looks like. So it shows the coincidence of um, low pH, which is the gray line, low dissolved oxygen, which is the black line, and low temperature, which is the dashed line. And because low dissolved oxygen, low pH, and um, low temperature often occur simultaneously during upwelling, it is really important for us to recreate these conditions in laboratory experiments when simulating um, how the ocean chemistry is going to change in the future. So a little bit about how fishes are being impacted by the multiple stressors associated with climate change. Globally, there have been shifts in abundance or the total number of individuals, distribution or geographical area where that species is found, and migration patterns. And this illustration depicts rising temperatures, um, forcing fish to move to cooler waters. Some fishes are more resilient um, and they're able to recover quickly from changing conditions, while others are a bit more sensitive and more impacted by changing conditions. So for this specific study, I focused on, um, I focused on how fishes are affected by um, two oceanographic stressors associated with climate change. And I chose ocean acidification or low pH 
and hypoxia or uh, low oxygen. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be using the term hypoxia to generally mean low oxygen content. And globally, there have been a number of studies that looked at the effect of OA and hypoxia on fishes. Exposure to OA has resulted in reduced odor cue detection, increased metabolic rate, reduced swimming speeds, higher mortality rates, reduced size, more deformities, and also no effect. Exposure to low oxygen has resulted in reduced fertilization and hatching success, reduced survival, more larval deformities, reduced size, metabolic depression, and also no effect. And there haven't been many studies on the combined stressors of OA and hypoxia. And it is important to look at not only because it's ecologically relevant, but also because the interaction between the multiple stressors is unpredictable. So stressors can have an additive interaction, which is the sum of the two independent stressors, a synergistic interaction, which is more than the effect when the two independent stressors are added together, or an antagonistic interaction, which is less than the effect when the two independent stressors are added together. And our lab group, uh, including Moss Lady grad students and the NOAA Early Life History team, have done a number of studies on the effect of OA and hypoxia on juvenile rockfish and the effect of hypoxia on larval rockfish. And they found that exposure to hypoxia reduced larval survival and increased deformities in blue and brown rockfish. And th this research paved the way for my study, which is the first of its kind to look at the combined stressors of ocean acidification and hypoxia on gestating rockfish. So I've introduced um, the changing ocean chemistry and how it impacts other species. And now I'd like to tell you about why it's important to study rockfish. First off, rockfish are just plain awesome. Um, they can live to over 200 years, release up to 2 million babies at one time, and live anywhere from a tide pool to a submarine canyon. Um, but besides all that, they are also an economically important family of fishes. And there's both a commercial and recreational fishery that generated over $7.5 million in 2020. They're ecologically important as well. Um, they are the most species rich genus in the California current with over 65 closely related rockfish species. And they are also an integral part of the coastal nearshore food web and are a food source for sea lions, great white sharks, and many others. And rockfishes are also ideal candidates for studies on the effect of OA and hypoxia on reproduction because their habitat on the California coastal shelf is becoming increasingly inundated with low pH and low dissolved oxygen water, um, especially during spring upwelling months. And it is unknown how these stressors are going to impact rockfish reproduction. We do, however, know that rockfish already have highly variable reprodu reproductive success and environmental conditions do play a role in the success or failure of each year class. So before getting too deep in the world of reproductive biology, I'd like to define some terms. First, um, matriotrophic viviparity means giving birth to live young and transferring energy to embryos during gestation. Gestation is the time between fertilization and birth. Partrition, which you'll hear me say a lot, is the birth of live young. Pelagic larval duration is the time larvae spend offshore um, in the water column before metamorphizing into juveniles. And annual recruitment is the number of fish that survive to the juvenile phase. Now I'll tell you a little bit about rockfish reproduction and why it may be compromised in more acidic and hypoxic water. <clears throat> Rockfish reproduce through internal fertilization and exhibit matriotrophic viviparity. So they transfer energy and nutrients through these specialized structures to the embryos. And you can see the embryos developing inside the female in this diagram. Gestation takes around one month in most rockfish species, but this does depend on the temperature. And during this period of gestation, environmental conditions can dictate the health and condition of larvae at birth. And during upwelling events, hypoxic water comes into rockfish habitat, and it may be stressful for gestating 
rockfish um, to meet their high oxygen demands in low oxygen upwelling conditions. So female rockfish generally give birth to hundreds of thousands of larvae um, at once. And again, this depends on the species and the female size. Um, and although they give birth to you know, thousands of larvae, very few of them actually survive to adulthood. And the characteristics of larvae when they're born influences how many survive the high mortality larval phase. So after parturition or birth, larvae swim and are swept offshore for their pelagic larval duration. And that usually lasts around one to two months, but um, again, varies depending on the species. And oceanic events during the pelagic larval phase influence the success of the subsequent year classes. So at the end of the pelagic phase, larvae metamorphize to the young of the year and recruit as juveniles or pelagic larvae to the nearshore environment such as kelp forests. And the additional stressors of low pH and low dissolved oxygen that rock fishes on the coastal shelf are now being increasingly exposed to, um, that might influence the number of larvae that survive past the high mortality larval phase. And for these experiments, I conducted research on blue, brown, rosy, and gopher rockfish. But for the purpose of this presentation, I will only focus on the gophers because they're the species I, um, I collected most of my data on. So my study species is the gopher rockfish or Sebastes carnatus. And they have a common depth range of 12 to 37 meters. They eat crustaceans and small fish and live on the rocky reefs beneath kelp forests. Their peak partrition or time of year that they're having the most babies is in March. And after birth, their larvae, uh, their larvae live offshore in the pelagic for about two months um, before they recruit to the kelp canopy. And part of the reason we chose this species is because during upwelling, um, sorry, part of the reason we chose this species is because spring upwelling coincides pretty perfectly with their peak partrition in March. And we wanted to know how exposure to low pH and low dissolved oxygen will influence their reproductive output. So in order to understand how climate change stressors will affect gopher rockfish reproduction, I asked the following research questions. One, how are the following life history parameters, which you could see in the table, um, how are those affected by low pH and low dissolved oxygen stressors? And I hypothesize that low pH would cause an increase in deformities, reduction in larval size, re reduction in fecundity, reduction in survival, increase in metabolism, and hypoxia tolerance would be unaffected. I hypothesize that low DO would cause an increase in deformities, decrease in larval size, decrease in fecundity, decrease in survivorship, decrease in metabolism, and an increase in hypoxia tolerance. And I hypothesize that the combined stressors of low pH and low dissolved oxygen would have an additive or synergistic interaction by increasing deformities, decreasing larval size, reducing the fecundity, and reducing survivorship. I thought that the interaction would be antagonistic on metabolism because while low pH often increases metabolism, low oxygen often decreases metabolism. So I thought the effects would kind of cancel each other out. And I hypothesized that there would be an additive interaction on hypoxia tolerance and hypoxia tolerance would increase by the same amount in combined stressor as it would for low oxygen. So that was a lot, I know. Uh, my next two research questions are a bit more straightforward. My second research question is, does maternal exposure or larval exposure to stressors have a bigger effect on larval condition? And I hypothesized that um, the, the maternal exposure to low pH and low DO stressors would be more significant than the larval exposure. And my third question is how does maternal size influence larval condition? And I hypothesize that bigger females would produce more and higher quality larvae. Okay, so now on to my methods. Uh, I should first note that I was a Sea Grant trainee which provided funding for me throughout these experiments. 
My research took place in Monterey Bay, which is highlighted with the purple box um, on the map of California. And my fish collection sites are highlighted with the green stars and um, they're off the coast of Monterey and Carmel. And all of my laboratory research took place at the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center in Santa Cruz. And that's at the northern tip of Monterey Bay and um, it's highlighted with the yellow star in this map. I collected female rockfish using hook and line fishing techniques on sport fishing boats in Monterey. Um, and go for rockfish collection trips commenced at the start of their reproduction season in February and March. And this was to ensure that we collected females who have mated but not yet internally fertilized. And egg development was assessed on board the fishing vessel via catheterization by Neosha Kashef and Dave Stafford. And after collection, rockfish were placed in coolers with bubblers and transported to the NOAA lab in Santa Cruz. And this facility has been used extensively for rockfish reproduction studies. So it was a really um, great place to do our research. And for this experiment, I exposed both mother rockfish and their larvae to simulated future ocean conditions. And you can look to the experimental design diagram to see how this all worked. So adult females were held in one of four maternal treatments. There's control shown in blue, and that's ambient pH and ambient dissolved oxygen. And that ended up being um, around a pH of eight and dissolved oxygen content of around nine. There's the low pH treatment shown in green, and that's a pH of 7.5 and ambient dissolved oxygen. There is the low DO, which is shown in red, um, low DO or low dissolved oxygen. And that one is ambient pH and four milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen. And lastly, the combined stressor tank, which is shown in purple. And that tank has both 7.5 pH and four milligrams per liter. And we, um, we chose these pH and DO levels based on water chemistry that is currently observed in the Monterey Bay um, during strong upwelling events for short durations. And these levels are projected to become more common due to climate change. So in our experiments, adults remained in their treatment for the duration of embryological development. Um, and then after parturition or birth, Larvae from each female were transferred into the same four treatments, control, low pH, low dissolved oxygen, and cross. 400 larvae per treatment were transferred into two two-gallon buckets for the survival trial. 2,000 larvae per treatment were transferred into one five-gallon bucket for the physiological study. 20 larvae were collected to photograph, and the rest were collected and preserved in ethanol so that we could later do the deformity quantification and the fecundity count. So every morning, um, I examined tanks for parturition events, which looked like this. Basically, the tank would be filled with up to 150,000 baby rockfish. And these days were always super exciting, very busy, and very, very long days. So. Yeah, big thank you to all of the brave souls that joined us on those days. Moving on to the trial timeline. Um, this, uh, this basically shows a timeline of all the trials that we ran. Um, and there will be an asterisk next to the trials that were run by my collaborators. And on partrition day, I started the survival trial, which ran until 50% mortality was reached. And on partrition day or birthday, we also photographed larvae, sampled for gene expression, and collected the rest of the larvae in the fecundity and preserved them in ethanol. On day one, I ran respirometry trials and Neosha ran swimming trials. And on day five, to understand the effect of larval treatment on larval condition, we ran respirometry, swimming trials, photographed larvae, and sampled for gene expression. So now I will begin with my fecundity methods. Um, I split the preserved fecundity sample into four smaller samples of 300 to 500 larvae. And I used a plankton splitter, which is this device that's shown in the video twirling around. Um, and I documented the number of times the sample was divided to estimate the proportion of the brood that the final sample represents. And I counted um, the total number of larvae and two to three samples per female using a dissecting scope. 
Um, and I did this in order to calculate the total fecundity of each female. In order to calculate the weight specific fecundity for each female, I divided the total fecundity by the weight in grams of each female. All right, next up are the, is the deformity quantification. Um, I inspected two to three preserved samples per brood, um, and each sample had around 300 to 500 larvae. And for this trial, I counted and identified all deformed larvae and all normal larvae to get the percent deformity for each brood. And the most common deformities I saw were eye deformities and runts, um, or tiny little underdeveloped guys. Um, and I should note that these photos are of live larvae rather than preserved larvae. And I inspected preserved larvae for this quantification. Now on to larval morphometrics. Photographs were taken of 20 non-deformed larvae per brood by David Stafford on partrition day and five days post partrition. I measured large, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I measured larval morphometrics using image J processing system. And I took measurements on the surface area of the eye, the notochord length, the surface area of the oil globule, and width. And this is more technically known as body depth, but I'll be using the term width to describe it in this presentation. So I will begin with my results now. This slide uh, shows the effect of maternal stressors on uh, and maternal length on weight specific fecundity or larvae per gram. And I'll orient you to my bar plots that I use throughout the results. Um, the treatments are shown with control in blue, 7.5 in green, um, four milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen or low DO in red, and cross shown in purple. And bar plots on the left side show the mean weight specific fecundity, plus or minus standard error for each treatment. And I used linear mixed effects model for most of my analyses on the effects of low pH and low DO on rockfish. And in all of my mixed effects models, water treatment is the fixed effect and female ID is the random effect. And I found that um, there was no effect in maternal treatment on weight specific fecundity. However, the trend was for fecundity to be lowest in the combined stressor treatment. And to unpack this farther, I assessed the effect of maternal size on total fecundity. Um, the figure on the right shows the effect of maternal fork length on total fecundity or number of larvae. And I found that uh, gopher rockfish total fecundity ranged quite a bit from a low of 9,000 larvae in the combined stressor treatment to a high of 145,000 larvae in the low dissolved oxygen treatment. And in all analyses that assess the influence of maternal size, I use ANCOVAs to analyze the effect of maternal length while incorporating treatment into the model. And if the effect is significant, the trend line will be in solid black. And if it is not significant, it will be a dashed line. And I will only add trend lines for the individual treatments if there is a significant interaction between treatment and maternal, and maternal length. And looking at these results, I found that smaller gopher rockfish produce smaller fecundities. But when I look at the weight specific fecundities, I found that there was still a trend for bigger fish produce, producing bigger weight specific fecundities, but the relationship was not significant as you can see by the dashed line. All right, now on to deformity results. Bar plots on the left side show maternal treatment on the X axis and percent deformity on the Y. And I found no effect of maternal treatment on percent deformity due to extreme variability among the mothers. And although not significant, there is a trend that shows increased percent deformity in low oxygen treatments. Um, and while the average percent deformity in the combined stressor treatment was over four times more than the control treatment, there was one female in the combined stressor treatment that only had 1.65% deformity. So this really shows that not all females in the combined stressor treatment give birth to broods with um, a high percent deformity. So to unpack this a bit further, I assess the effect of maternal size on percent deformity. 
And this figure shows maternal fork length on the x-axis and percent deformity on the y-axis. And I found the effect of maternal body size on percent deformity is marginally non-significant with a p-value of 0.08. Um, but the trend does suggest that smaller females have higher percent deformity in their broods. And I'd like to note that this trend seems to be driven by three small females with high percent deformity. One female from the low pH treatment had 15% deformity. One female from the low dissolved oxygen treatment had 32% deformity. And one female from the cross treatment had 40% deformity. And this is in contrast to the highest deformity percent in the control treatment, which was only 4%. Okay, moving on to morphometrics. Um, this principal component analysis or PCA shows the effect of treatment on larval morphology. And I used measurements of notochord length, surface area of the eye, surface area of the oil globule, and width, and I did this for 200 larvae. And for treatments, control is blue, low pH is green, low dissolved oxygen is red, and cross is purple, the same color scheme as before. And I found that PC axes one and two accounted for 64% cumulative variance in the data with negative values on PC axis one corresponding to larvae that are large in length, eye size, and body width and positive scores corresponding to larvae with larger oil globules. And positive scores on axis two were associated with large oil globules and body width. And I noticed that the cross treatment did trend toward shorter, narrower larvae with smaller oil. However, these shifts are pretty subtle as you can see based on the overlap of the ellipses and no significant differences were observed. And these figures show the relationship between maternal fork length on the x-axis and larval morphological traits, um, including notochord length, width, eye size, and oil globule size on the y-axis. And for these, I found no significant effects of maternal length on morphometrics, but there were some non-significant trends that showed bigger fish have larvae with bigger oil and smaller eyes. All right, so, in conclusion, how did I do on my hypotheses for this section? Well, not great. Um, <laughs> I found that deformity, fecundity, and larval morphology were not impacted by low pH, low dissolved oxygen stressors. And overall, gopher rockfish are resilient to these stressors, although there are some indications of sensitivity. There was a trend for increased deformities in the low oxygen treatment and a trend for lower fecundities in the cross treatment. I also found that larger gopher rockfish produce larger broods and have non-significant trends towards higher weight specific fecundities, um, a larvae trend toward bigger oil globules, and also trend toward fewer deformities. Okay, moving on to the larval survival trial. So just a reminder of the experimental setup. Um, upon partrition, larvae were collected, counted, and dispensed into larval tanks. And the treatments were control, low pH, low dissolved oxygen, and combined stressor. And larvae were not fed throughout the duration of this trial. And so the test evaluates resistance to starvation. And I used a plastic syringe to remove dead larvae once every day until 50% mortality was reached in each tank. Um, and the picture on the left here shows the survival bucket set up at the NOAA lab um, and a cool picture of some larvae taken by Dave Stafford. So on to the results and um, conclusions for larval survival trials. Um, bar plots on the left side show the average survival or days to 50% mortality on the y-axis, and maternal treatments are on the x-axis, and larval treatments are clustered within the maternal treatments um, on the x-axis. And I found that gopher rockfish survivability was not affected by maternal stressors or larval stressors to treatments. And the average survivability was very similar among all treatments, varying by less than one day to 50% mortality. 
And the figure on the right shows the effect of maternal fork length on the x-axis, on survival on the y-axis. And as you can see, there's really not much of a relationship and maternal length did not affect larval survival. So now on to the respirometry trials. I ran respirometry on both day one and day five post partition. Um, and I did this to test how larval metabolic rates respond to both the maternal stressors and also the larval stressors. So the respirometry experimental design looked a bit like this. Um, on day one, after every partition, I placed three larvae per well into 20 wells with the same water conditions the mother gestated in. For this example, the female gestated in control water. And so the day one respirometry was run in control. And four wells had no larvae and acted as a control to measure background microbial respiration. And I later incorporated this into my analyses to refine the oxygen consumption estimates. And on day five postpartition, larvae were taken from all four larval treatments with three larvae per well, 40 wells per trial, and 10 wells per treatment. And I ran my experiments using this cool closed, closed system microplate respirometer, um, which you can see pictured above with the cute little larvae inside the wells. Um, and I did this to measure larval oxygen consumption rates. So the program that I used recorded the change in oxygen concentration every 15 seconds until wells reached 0% oxygen. And I weighed five larvae per species to calculate the average larval mass. And I used this in calculating the standard metabolic rate using the FishRes software um, in R. And I also calculated hypoxia tolerance or PCRIT. And I did this using the broken stick regression method. Uh, and I also, I used the respirometry package in R for this. And the broken stick method entails fitting two linear regressions to the oxygen consumption curve. And the point where they intersect is the point where larvae switch from aerobic to anaerobic respiration. And so more hypoxia tolerant larvae will have a lower PCRIT, meaning they can tolerate lower oxygen levels before switching to anaerobic respiration. Okay, so now on to the last results section. I'll start with my metabolic rate results. This slide shows the SMR or standard metabolic rate on day one. Um, and the bar plot shows the effect of maternal treatment on the x-axis on day one SMR on the y-axis. And the SMR of gopher rockfish larvae trended towards higher SMR in the combined stressor treatments, but there is no significant effect of maternal treatment on standard metabolic rate. And the figure on the right shows the effect of maternal fork length, and that's on the x-axis, on day one SMR on the y-axis. And I also found that there was no effect of female size on day one standard metabolic rate. Okay, moving on to day five standard metabolic rate. Bar plots on the left show the average day five SMR on the Y axis and the maternal treatments on the X axis and the larval treatments are clustered within the maternal treatment on the X axis. And I found that on day five post partition, larval SMR did not differ based on larval treatment or maternal treatment. And now looking at the figure on the right, um, this one shows the effect of maternal fork length, and that's on X axis, on day five standard metabolic rate on the Y axis. And the effect of maternal size on day five standard metabolic rate was marginally non-significant with the p-value of 0.06. Um, however, larvae from bigger fish did trend towards a higher SMR. Now, because the interaction term was significant, I overlaid the individual regressions from each maternal treatment. And this interaction shows that bigger control fish produce larvae with higher SMRs, but that trend did not hold for, um, for either low pH or low dissolved oxygen females. And bigger fish from the combined stressor treatment also had higher day five SMRs, but they did not increase by as much as they did in the control treatment. Now onto the hypoxia tolerance or PCRIT. 
The bar plot on the left shows the effect of maternal treatment on the x-axis on day one PCRIT, um, on, and that's on the y-axis. And the average day one PCRIT ranged from 12% in the low dissolved oxygen treatment to 20% in the low pH treatment. And while the low oxygen treatments do have a lower average PCRIT, um, there was high variation within each treatment. And I found that gopher rockfish PCRIT was not affected by climate change stressors. The figure on the right shows the effect of maternal fork length and that's on the x-axis on day one PCRIT, which is on the y-axis. And I found that PCRIT was lower in larvae from bigger female, females. Um, and that means that those larvae are more hypoxia tolerant. Okay, last result slide. Hypoxia tolerance, day five. Um, bar plots on the left side show the average day five PCRIT on the y-axis and the maternal treatments on the x-axis. And again, larval treatments are clustered within the maternal treatments on the x-axis. And I found that larval PCRIT, larval PCRIT on day five was not affected by larval treatment or the previous maternal treatment. And the figure on the right shows the effect of maternal fork length on the x-axis on day five PCRIT on the y-axis. And by day five post partition, there was no longer any difference in hypoxia tolerance based on the female size. Although there was still this trend that shows bigger females producing more hypoxia tolerant larvae. Okay, so now to summarize my findings for the respirometry section, I'll go back to my hypotheses. A red X will pop up next to the hypothesis I got wrong, and a smiley guy will pop up next to the hypothesis I got right. So I found that low pH conditions did not cause metabolism to increase and did not change the hypoxia tolerance. And I found that low dissolved oxygen did not reduce metabolism and also did not influence hypoxia tolerance. The combined stressor treatment did not impact larval metabolism and also did not increase the hypoxia tolerance. There was, however, a trend for more hypoxia tolerant larvae in low oxygen conditions. And in response to my question about how size impacts larval SMR and PCRIT, I found that bigger fish have um, larvae with higher metabolic rates in the control treatment on day five, and bigger fish produce more hypoxia tolerant larvae. And that concludes my results, so I'll now move on to my discussion. All right, so for my discussion, I will explain some of my results and talk about why it matters for management. I found that gestating gopher rockfish and their larvae are resilient to 7.5 pH and four milligrams per liter DO. And I can provide some explanations for why this might occur. So in the wild, gopher rockfish are likely exposed to low pH and low oxygen during their gestation in spring upland months. And a study in, um, a study in the Monterey Bay reported that during the spring upwelling season, pH and DO can dip down to below 7.5 pH and two milligrams per liter solved oxygen for an average of 1.5 hours a day at 17 meters depth. And as gopher rockfish have a common depth range of 12 to 37 meters, they are actually well within the upwelling depth on the coastal California shelf. And the typical onset of upwelling season in Monterey Bay coincides perfectly with gopher rockfish peak, peak partrition in March. Um, and so gopher rockfish have likely already been exposed to 7.5 pH and four milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen during their reproductive season and have had some time to adapt to their environment. And while I was at first surprised that gopher rockfish were pretty resilient to low pH and low dissolved oxygen, um, I reflected upon the studies that I referenced and found most of them were on the effect of low pH and low oxygen on oviparous fish. And oviparous fish lay eggs, which are externally fertilized and the embryos develop directly in the low pH and low oxygen environment. In oviparous fish, low oxygen and low pH can result in more deformities, lower survival, and can impact metabolic rate. However, rockfish are viviparous. 
and viviparous fish develop embryos inside them. And so it's possible that because the embryos develop inside the female rather than in the low pH uh, and low oxygen water itself, the mother provides a buffer to the stressful conditions by regulating her internal chemistry. And by the time the larvae are born, they seem to be physiologically capable of dealing with these stressors. There are some non-significant trends I'd like to discuss in this study. There is a trend for more hypoxia tolerant larvae from low oxygen treatments. And this suggested trend lines up with other studies, including studies on juvenile rockfish that show um, fish can adapt to low oxygen environments by lowering their pecrit. There are also some indications of sensitivity in gopher rockfish um, that I'd like to touch on. There is, um, there is a trend for increased deformities in low oxygen treatments. And in our study, there was also a trend for lower fecundities in a cross treatment. Another sign of sensitivity is that two females gave birth prematurely in the cross treatment. And premature birth has been observed in other species due to hypoxia exposure. And with low oxygen availability and hypoxic conditions and high oxygen demands during late gestation, females may have to release larvae prematurely in order to survive themselves. And additionally, um, in our preliminary study on brown rockfish, two gestating females died in the low, uh, in the two milligrams per liter treatment, which is why we chose a higher oxygen content for this study on gopher rockfish. So while overall gopher rockfish are tolerating these conditions, four milligrams per liter and 7.5 pH seem to be right on the cusp of what is tolerable. Some fish ap appear to be unaffected, while others experience high deformity and low fecundity. And although not significant, these trends may be ecologically relevant because a reduction in, to in the total number of larvae born and increase in percent deformity of brood, even from some fish, reduces the number of healthy larvae that can add to the local gopher rockfish population. And it also remains unknown how gopher rockfish will respond to more extreme low oxygen and low pH as climate change progresses. So to unpack all these trends further, we really need a larger sample size of adult rockfish. For our experiment, we used gopher rockfish that were collected in both 2017 and 2018 to get a sample size of only three to four females per treatment. We collected 33 fish, 19 of which gave birth, and only 16 of which we could actually use for our trials. So for future experiments of this nature, I suggest collecting a higher sample size of females. Ideally, I'll collect them in the same year, um, secure like a bunch of aquarium space, and also find a literal army of interns to help you. So experiments like this one on the effect of climate change on fishes is not just important for science, but it's also important for fisheries management. Fish stocks should be managed not only based on how many fish are being removed by fishermen, but also based on the effect climate change has on reproductive output, which directly impacts the population. Okay, so moving on to the role of female rockfish size. First, I'd just like to say that this study was not designed to look at the effect of size, and we intentionally targeted females within a fairly narrow size range. However, after I saw some effects of size, even within the narrow size range, I decided to look into it as a research question. So I found that larger fish have bigger fecundities, a trend observed in many rockfishes. And for this slide, significant trends will be shown in blue and non-significant trends shown in striped blue. I also found that there was a trend for increased weight specific fecundity with increased size. And a previous study on gopher rockfish by Sogard et al. also showed a non-significant trend for increased weight specific fecundity from larger fish. I also found that larger fish produce larvae that are more hypoxia tolerant on day one post partition. And this suggests that larvae from bigger females are more capable of dealing with low oxygen stressors. Another finding was that on day five, larval metabolic rates were higher in larvae from larger mothers in the control treatment, and larvae from larger rockfish are often provisioned with higher lipid content, and that provides them with the food source for a longer amount of time. And metabolic rate increases with increased feeding, so it follows that increased lipid stores would result in higher larval metabolic rates. And measurements for lipid stores on day five post partition are currently in preparation to 
cross-reference these results. There was also a marginally non-significant trend that showed larger fish trended towards lower percent deformity in their broods. So in order to get a better understanding of the reproductive output and larval condition of different size classes of gopher rockfish, and to understand how those different size classes respond to changes in ocean chemistry, future experiments should look at a wider range of fish sizes. And even within our narrow size range, we observed that bigger gopher rockfish produced more larvae or have a higher total fecundity and produce higher quality offspring. They're more tolerant to low oxygen and trend toward bigger oil globules and fewer deformities. And I think these trends would only become more clear with a larger size range. And understanding how female size affects larval condition is relevant for management and conservation because it can enable fisheries to set appropriate minimum and maximum sizes for collection. Uh, and this enables the protection of bigger females that may have a disproportionately high contribution to the population. However, we also need to protect the smaller fish because they are the source from which the older fish grow from. And marine protected areas with no take zones can protect all size classes of fish, enabling them to survive and successfully contribute to sustaining rockfish populations. So for my next steps in this research, I look forward to collaborating with the other scientists on this project, uh, Neosha Kashef, Dave Stafford, Jacoby Baker, and Melissa Palmashano. And I look forward to comparing all of our findings on the effect of climate change on lar larval and juvenile rockfish. And with that, I'll give a big thanks to everyone out there listening and move on to my acknowledgements. Okay, so as I mentioned, this was a highly collaborative project with funding from Sea Grant, NSF, and NOAA SK. And PIs on the project were from Moss Landing, UC Santa Cruz, Cal State Monterey Bay, and NOAA. First off, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Scott Hamilton. Thank you for always being available to meet up and talk about data and just get into the nitty gritty of this, um, of this very complicated project. And I honestly don't think I will ever understand how you find the time to advise all your students, teach classes, do your own research, apply for like a million grants, publish papers, be a dad, and have time to go surfing at lunch. It is honestly mind blowing. But really though, um, you've taught me so much over the years, definitely too many years, but I am eternally grateful for all of those invaluable lessons. Gita, I'm so grateful for your statistical wisdom. Um, you were instrumental in getting me through some tricky statistics. At times where I was about ready to break my computer, you would respond with a simple solution. Thank you so much for always being appro approachable and, um, and just really easy to talk to. Cheryl, thank you for referring me to the Moss Landing Program. Without you, I never would have applied. And also a big thanks for all of your physiological expertise, which was so helpful in figuring out how to analyze my respirometry data set. Sue, uh, thank you for providing your insights on reproductive biology. Your previous research has certainly laid the foundation for this project. Um, I also always appreciated that even though you were the director of the early life history team at NOAA, you would still come and join us on partrician days, counting thousands of baby rockfish with the rest of us. So now on to my two honorary committee members, Neosha Kashef and Dave Stafford. I honestly cannot overstate how instrumental these two were in making this project happen. Um, you provided me guidance through literally every aspect of running these experiments. So a huge thank you to you for everything. Um, other acknowledgements include Eric Sturm of uh, the NOAA lab, and he managed the aquarium water flow, which we were constantly tinkering with for these experiments. Melissa Palmashano was my partner on all of these experiments. She was funded on my research and I was funded on hers. So let's just say we spent like literally all of our time together in our first three years of grad school. Melissa, your work ethic and humbleness has always inspired me. Jacoby Baker, who took the lead on the genetics work for this experiments, we will forever be collaborating. Jake Klein to the uncle of my dog, Aura. Thank you for always staying way later than you needed to at the NOAA lab and spending countless nights on my couch in Santa Cruz. 
I'd also like to thank Sergei Morozov of FishRasp for having Zoom meetings with me all the way from Finland to figure out how to use his R package with my data set and ultimately writing a new version of the package for me. Thank you so much, Sergei. Um, I'd also like to thank the entire ichthyology lab for providing me so much support and feedback through the entire process. Um, a special thank you to Shelby, um, a postdoc in the lab who has been so helpful and just so available to help me with statistics. And lots of Moss Landing grad students helped me on this research. I'm sorry if I missed any of you on here, but I'm so grateful for your assistance. And to our army of interns, thank you with your help on all parts of running these experiments from um, you know daily checks on water chemistry to animal husbandry to assisting with the data collection. All of you guys were so instrumental and y'all are just amazing. On to my Moss Landing family, um, from diving to climate change marches to fishing trips to aquarium trips to getting crazy and having fun at conferences to the infamous, um, the infamous Moss Landing Halloween party. I have just been so grateful to have the camaraderie um, and also have the commiseration of making our way through this epic grad program. Next, my friends, um, to my boyfriend, Dan Lazarus. Wow. Um, I truly think that you are an angel in my life and I do not know how Oh, I did so well oh, without crying. Okay, I do not know how I would have made it through this last year without you. Thank you for supporting me and encouraging me and also for not asking about my thesis too much. To the rest of my friends in Washington and Santa Cruz, thank you for your support through this. I'm so grateful for the playful outlet you all provided with countless surf and body surf sessions, hikes in the woods, bonfires on the beach. I'm just so grateful to have friends like you um, along for all the highs and all the lows of this wild ride. And lastly, to my family, first my dog, Aura. I never would have found you if it hadn't been for a research trip up to Humboldt. Aura was truly an emotional support dog, giving me licks and snuggles and just honestly bringing so much joy to my life. To my whole family, I just love you guys all so much. Um, Dad, Mom, Ian, Eric, Robert, Hannah, Catherine. Um, you guys are amazing and just such an epic support system. A special thank to, thanks to my mom, Peggy, who I dedicate all of this work to. Um, thank you for encouraging me to get into the ocean since I was a baby um, and teaching me to learn from and protect the natural world. I am so grateful for your support along every step of my journey towards becoming a marine scientist. And with that, I will thank you all so much for listening and um, open it up to questions. All right, Kristen, way to go. That was a fantastic talk. Really thank good job. You. All right, who has questions? You can, under the reactions tab, you can click the raise your hand feature and we'll call on you. So here, while we're waiting for people to ask questions, I'll ask one. So given what you know right now, after sort of doing these experiments, I mean, one thing you said you do differently is maybe collect more or a wider size range. Is there anything else you might do differently, you know, in terms of the experimental design or things you were measuring to uh, understand better how the climate change might affect rockfish reproduction? Yeah, um, I think that having fewer treatments would enable me to get a bigger sample size. So um yeah like just looking at low oxygen um so yeah I, th I think that that would enable me to get the sufficient sample size that that i would have liked um you think that's a bigger impact you think hypoxia is likely to be worse for rockfish and reproduction than ocean acidification um yeah from everything that i have seen the larvae responded more to low oxygen than they did to low pH, like in terms of, and you know, there weren't a lot of significant results, but um, in terms of the trends that we saw, we saw a lot more deformities in the low oxygen treatment than we did in the low pH treatment. And so same with fecundity, didn't really see low pH impacting fecundity very much, but um, I did see some more effects with the, the low oxygen treatments. 
Great. All right. Who else is out there that wants to ask a question? Amanda, you can unmute yourself and turn on your video. Hi, Kristen. Fantastic amount of work. Holy cow, you did so much. And now I'm going to ask you for something completely different because I don't know the fish world. Um, do you think that other rock fishes with similar or with different life histories would have different tolerances based on kind of the models you were talking about in your conclusions? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, and that was kind of what we were, you know, supposed to be looking at with this experiment. Um, so I did collect a bunch of data on blue rockfish as well. Um, and I think that kind of like depending on at what time of year that rockfish is gestating and producing larvae, I think that that will impact um, like their reproductive success. So um, for instance, um, I know a study by Neosha and uh, Sue Sogard and Dave that's currently in preparation. They did research on low oxygen and how it affects blue rockfish. Um, and they found that there were significantly more deformities in the low oxygen treatment. Um, and this may be because blue rockfish um, tend to spawn earlier than gophers. So um, they like might not in nature be exposed to upwelling as much. And so they might not have kind of like as much of a, a tolerance to it as say the gophers because they're kind of like always reproducing in upwelling conditions. Right, really interesting, cool. Thank you, that's perfect. And yeah, congrats again. That was an amazing talk. Thanks, Amanda. All right, who else? Got some other questions for Kristen? Alexandra, you're up. You can unmute yourself and- Hey, I'm trying to figure out how to unmute. And then I think, oh, there's my video. Um, I have more of a comment than a question. I just wanted to, I'm one of Kristen's friends from home um, from Bainbridge Island. And I think it's really cool to see her recognized in her science community. And I just want to say Kiki, I'm so proud of you. And it was really, really cool to hear your presentation. Thank you, Ali, love you. Thank you, that was very nice. <laughs> Any other questions for Kristen? I might let you off easy here. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you were so thorough in your presentation. Ah, I guess I answered everything. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your committee members are saving some zingers for the, for the committee meeting. <laughs> All right, well, if no one else has questions, then why don't you all turn your videos on and congratulate Kristen for a minute or two, and then we'll uh, ask you to leave and we'll have a separate committee meeting. Yay, Congratulations, Kristen. Kristen. Good job, Kristen. Good job, Kristen. You're amazing, we love you. Huh? Oh, Thanks everybody. Congratulations, Kristen. Yeah, Thank nice you. Job. Chris, that was great. You're amazing. You're a rockfish rock star, Kristen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Get a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs>